Hi, my name is Mike Abin, and welcome to episode 29 of my beta campaign. We have a variety of things coming at us in this particular episode, but first, we have some business that we need to take care of. Some unfinished business. Uh, the primary bit of which is the finally set up our moon base. Now, you may recall that last episode, due to a fuel miscalculation, um, I ended up with the lab module of my moon base uh, unable to make a landing. So I left it in low lunar orbit and uh, needed to come up with a plan on how I was going to get some fuel into it. So you may also recall from last episode that we left uh, Tom Plock and Genimal in the Tycho, which was docked with the Kanata station, also in lunar orbit. And... There is this transfer stage still attached to the station, and so what I decided to do is to transfer every last bit of fuel out of it into the Tycho. I'll have to deal with that trans getting rid of that transfer stage at some later date. Um, and, you know, b being good guests, Tom Plock and General also made sure that the... Uh, the cupboards were full and uh, that the station still had plenty of snacks for whoever the next residences of the station were going to be. And they even did the nice thing of making sure the toilets were cleaned out. And then it came time to undock and make our way over to that lab module. And while we're performing the rendezvous, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in detail of what's going on in this particular episode. Along with the setting up of our moon base, we have a number of other missions coming at you as well, including another unmanned lunar lander and a launch of a second probe on its way to Moho, and this time it is going to be a lander. Um, one thing that came up, though, with the rendezvous, the rendezvous went without too much of an issue here, but uh, I did have some issue when it came to matching velocities. I, w I wasn't sure what this was all about. Just as I thought I had velocities all sort of matched up and ready to go, and, you know, I sent Genimal out so that she could hook up uh, some pipes. There is no um, docking port on the lab module, so I'm going to have to connect it together using these KAS uh, pipes so I can transfer some fuel back and forth. But just as I send Genimal out there, I turn around, and the next thing you know, we're separating. I don't know what's up with this. And what I thought was an almost zero um, relative velocity between the two vessels turned into over a meter per second. So this turned into a little bit of a frustrating... Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. I had to really, you know, I had to bring the, the Tycho back into um, a relative velocity of zero with the lab module. And, of course, by then, Genimal, who'd been flowing around in space, she's kind of off doing doing her own thing. Uh, and uh, eventually, though, we did get it all connected together, transferred the fuel over. And once fuel was transferred and we separated the two vessels, it was very clear that between the two vessels, they had plenty of fuel now to perform the landing and we can get this base started. Now both of these two vessels are going to the same location but I, I thought it would be prudent to put down the unmanned lab module down first uh, just in case I don't know something goes wrong I don't want it crashing into uh, a habitat that might have some kerbals in it so I thought the safest thing to do would put the be putting the kerbals down last. Um, so I set my Descent trajectory the way I normally do. I've done a few moon landings now, so I don't think I need to spend too much time with this. Though it's pretty obvious here that I left my uh, burn to kill off my horizontal velocity uh, to too late. <laughs> and I'm overshooting my target. Uh, yeah, well, at least it's a good thing that this vehicle does have uh, quite a bit of extra fuel. Um, one thing that's a little bit unusual about this particular vehicle is that the orientation of the transfer stage and the vehicle attached to that transfer stage are 90 degrees to each other. So once I stage and get rid of the transfer stage, I have to change my focus to that other probe body and then reorient the lab module to continue my descent. Um, and you know how, I don't know, it was a couple of episodes ago I, I said that uh, I should get into sandbox mode and practice uh, landing at specific targets. Well, as you can see here, I did not practice, or I did not heed my own advice. Yeah, oh uh, yeah, that was a little rough.
Um, but I, th I thought I'd take advantage of the extra fuel that this thing has now, and, uh, you know, I wasn't satisfied before it was, so I thought I would transfer it over a little bit closer to the habitat module. In fact, I was starting to get pretty comfortable with, uh, with all of this transferring around to specific targets, and I thought, you know, this approach is looking pretty good until, uh, I mixed up the Z button, the X button, hit the Z button instead of the X button. Oh man, sometimes I'm amazed I get these things, these things down safely at all. And with that finally accomplished, it was now Tom Plox and Genimal's turn, and once again I overshoot my mark, though not as badly as last time, though this time I was thrusting down a little bit too vigorously and gave myself a little bit too much up velocity so I had to wait for the thing to come back down again uh, one kind of an annoying thing that happens now that I got so many things on the surface I mean I, I have four different objects now there on the surface the habitat module lab module the nuclear generator and that fun little piece of debris and each of them as we move in towards the render distance has to be rendered separately so you get these these really annoying kind of pauses uh, as you come come in towards the landing site, but you know otherwise actually after that initial sort of uh, Little bit of a hiccup that this landing ended up going reasonably well So what I'll do is I'll let you just kind of watch the whole thing at two time speed now that it's actually a landing that I am At least not completely embarrassed about safely it was time to bang off a few contracts I have three different contracts that uh, that we can uh, accomplish right now and that's a good thing because that will move me ever closer to getting the 4.7 million curb bucks that I need to upgrade my research and development center uh, contract number one was to simply transmit some science from the surface of the moon so I thought the easiest thing to do would be just to take a crew report and transmit that so that takes care of that one uh, con uh, contract number two was to plant a flag on the surface of the moon so we get Genimal and Tom Plock both out there and as the pilot and I think by default the commander Tom Plock gets the honor of placing that flag and Finishing off that particular contract. Uh, let's see. What are we going to type here? Canada base. We're here to stay. Anyway, uh, then become then comes the tedious process of hooking this base together. And what I'm going to use are a couple of KAS parts. One is going to be these um, these uh, fuel pipes. Once you connect things together with fuel pipes, uh, KSP then sees that as a single uh, vessel. Um, now the fuel pipes stretch about, I think they're about 20 meters or so that the fuel pipes will stretch. So to extend the, the range of these fuel pipes, what we can use are these ground pylons, which also come from KAS. And uh, you can just drop these on the ground and then start attaching things to them. So we can use a couple of pipes now to attach things together. And the first things I want to attach together are the lab module and the habitat module. Because once those two things are together, um, that now fulfills the requirements of the base and then the base contract is now done and then comes time to connect on the nuclear generator remember again that this thing's going to be spending about three Kerbin days at in the night time and so solar panels will quickly drain out the won't, the batteries will quickly drain out once the solar panels aren't working so uh, we're going to use a nuclear generator to power, power this thing. Uh, turns out that uh, the nuclear generator, which is about 40 meters away from the habitat, or 50 meters away, I'm sorry, from the habitat module, uh, needs three pipes in order to get to it, which means I need an extra ground pylon. So this ended up necessitating disconnecting and moving the lab module a little bit closer, but that went without incident. And then once the nuclear generator was all was all connected it was time to fire this thing up 
and uh, and get it all working and operational. So with that all done, let's take a step back and take a look at the fruits of our labor. Um, one unfortunate thing that happened here is because of the shoddiness of my landings, I ended up with only about 450 meters per second of delta V in that lander once all the fuel that was available was transferred to it, which is not enough to get these guys back into orbit, which is not a big deal, but I just, I just don't like it. I always think Kerbal should have the ability to get themselves home should, you know, disaster strike or anything like that. But the eventual plan is to land a carbonite refinery down here so that this base will be able to start manufacturing its own fuel. And once that's done, um, then these guys will be able to get themselves back home. Uh, and I plan on doing that now rather sooner rather than later because I, I, I want to minimize the amount of time these guys are stuck here on the lunar surface. But quite frankly, they seem pretty pleased with their new abode and the view certainly seems nice. And so I think it's time to bid farewell because it's time to move on to other things. And one of those other things is the Aristarchus doing some temperature scans, aerial temperature scans around Kerbin, and uh, this is the 13th mission, 13th flight of the Aristarchus, and normally I wouldn't spend hardly any time with a mission like this because it has become entirely routine, but there is something special about this particular mission because in all likelihood, this represents the final flight of the Aristarchus. That nuclear plane that I was playing with, I can't remember if it was last episode or the episode before that, but I've gotten it into a form that I'm very, very pleased with. It's more maneuverable than the Aristarchus. It has a similar landing and takeoff speed to the Aristarchus, so it'll be able to land in similar terrain. But on top of that, its highest altitude and top speed beats that of the Aristotle II, which was my high altitude uh, supersonic jet. So um, this thing outperforms all the planes that, are, or the, not this one, but the nuclear jet that I have coming, outperforms every plane that I have, so it makes no sense to keep them around anymore. But I did have this thing in the, um, in the hangar already built, so I thought, you know what, let's give it a final take or uh, send off. It would have been nice to have Tom Plock be the pilot because Tom Plock was the original pilot of the Aristarchus way back in episode 8. But of course, we left Tom Plock on the surface of the moon, so that honor has befallen Jeb. Um, so, Jeb has taken this thing for its final, uh, final uh, flight, and uh, yeah, everything went off perfectly fine and uh, it was time then it became time to bring this thing back home and I don't know stick it in the uh, Kerbal version of the Smithsonian I suppose and that brings us to Muna 4 being dropped off by the Samyaji 2 on the night side of Kerbin in low Kerbin orbit and the mission for Muna 4 is to pick up a single surface temperature scan on the moon so it's just going to this one very specific location and the whole idea behind this particular build was light and cheap. So the whole thing is actually powered completely on simply monopropellant. Yeah, I got those monopropellant thrusters, and uh, that's about it. Other than that, it's just got bare essentials to keep it going. Some solar panels, some, uh, some batteries, an antenna. And uh, one extra thing, I also wanted to do a, a dry run, a, a run nearby of these Landatron motors that I've talked about a couple of times in this particular uh, series and this time this is the first time though I'm using them um, in an actual mission and I want to sort of test them out and get get some use to them before I end up using them on a mission where I'm far away from from Kerbin like you know on Duna or, or Moho or something like that. As far as the transfer and insertion goes, this is pretty much standard fare, except for the fact that I did want to land at a very specific location that is quite a way south of the moon's equator. So that necessitated thinking about my trajectory before I got to the moon's uh, SOI. So here I am performing a mid-course correction to change my inclination as I enter into the moon's sphere of influence. And all I'm thinking about is being in a good position, getting in a good orbit, so that my orbit will go right over my landing location when I get there. Now you actually did get a bit of a preview of this vessel in the last episode when I was demonstrating the sim mode 
of Kerbal construction time and how you can actually simulate, start your simulation in orbit around foreign bodies. And at that time, um, I did a practice landing of this thing and I ended up without any hysterics and without any faux pas putting it right down on the money in the dark. That was in sim mode. Now comes the question, can I do this in now that it's for real, now that if I mess up, it's it's done. Um, well, let's just cut to the, set, the descent and find out. Now, after overshooting my last two landings, I thought I'd finally get a little bit clever about this, if this can be called clever. And I set myself up a maneuver node. And you can see here I got a 26-second burn, and that is set up to pretty much completely kill off my horizontal velocity. So all I have to do is place the node right above where I want to end up, and it should work out fine, except for the fact what I should be doing, I started burning 26 seconds before the maneuver node, and I got it in my head, I don't know why I did that, you should be splitting the maneuver node on either side, I should have started the burn 13 seconds before, but for some reason I got into my head, no, I need to start right now, I don't know why, maybe my coffee hadn't kicked in yet, but the end result of all of this was that I was falling well short of my, topic, or my uh, target now. So that necessitated a second burn to try and um, push myself horizontally again to give myself some horizontal velocity so I can get towards the target. And by this point, I was moving along horizontally. Now, Landatrons, I had to engage them because these things go off automatically, these Landatrons. What they do is they, they look at your radar altitude, and when it is the time for them to turn on, they're going to turn on, and they only have one, two settings. They can be off or they can be on. So when they come on, they're going to come on at full thrust. So it's going to do a suicide burn. And when they came on, I still had a respectable amount of horizontal velocity. Now what I did is I locked myself in the full up position with, an, with a, a pitch of 90 degrees. Um, that might not have been the best thing to do, but that's what I ended up doing. And so now the, the Landatrons, they come on and I'm moving horizontally and I got really, really lucky because I ended up moving horizontally on a downward slope. So I was moving down, but the ground was moving away from me at the same time. And I have these stick anywhere RCS thrusters, those little, those little micro RCS thrusters, and I was able to use those. Remember, this thing only has monoprop on it, so plenty of monoprop. I was able to use those to arrest my horizontal velocity. And by the time I was actually ready to sit down on the ground, I was just falling vertically, and uh, it landed just perfectly and was in the right spot. So all I needed to do now was to do my uh, temperature scan and finish off this particular contract. And that brings us to the final mission of this video. This is the Kepler. And uh, it turns out I got another MOHO window coming up, my second MOHO window. And so I thought I'd do something a little bit different and this guy is going to be a moho lander. Now, I'll talk about it in a second, but I just wanted to watch those Globe Ones. Those are the KW Rocketry Boosters Globe Ones. They're always bizarre when they come off, and I don't know why I use them. They look like they're on the edge of disaster every time I use them. They're too small to connect separatrons or anything to them, so I can never separate them cleanly, but I don't know. I find them too entertaining, I think. But anyway, the Kepler. Uh, well, let's let's talk about uh, Johannes Kepler as this thing is on its way up, getting into more and more famous scientists now all the time. Johannes Kepler, a 17th century German uh, astronomer. And then and, and, uh, an assistant to Tycho Brahe, and that part is, is uh, significant because I talked about Tycho Brahe before. Uh, the Lunar, lunar lander that I have is named after him, and I talked about um, his precision as a, a data collector, as a as a as an observationalist, and Kepler um, inherited all the all that very precise orbital data and was trying to come up with rules to try and get the predictions of planetary locations down and it didn't seem like any of these models that exist in the past that go all the way back in antiquity all the way back to Ptolemy never seemed to get it quite right and even with Copernicus with this heliocentric model for the solar system that Kepler completely bought I thought that made perfect sense to me 
but Copernicus's model just simply didn't work. And he was trying now with, with Brahe's very precise data to try and see if he can get it to work. And of course, he's the one that made the key observation that we're not, you know, we shouldn't be sticking with circles all the time, right? We're not circles in uniform motions. We're talking about ellipses. And he was the one that applied ellipses to planetary bodies, right? And uh, came up with the very famous Kepler's laws, three three very famous Kepler's laws for planetary motions, that the motions of planets are ellipses with the sun at one of the foci of the ellipses, that the planet will sweep out equal areas as it goes around the ellipse. So when it's further away from the, uh, from the focus, from the sun, it must be going slower because then the height of the triangle to the sun would be higher. And as we're really close to the sun, um, we, we, uh, it's going to be going faster. And of course, that models what we actually do observe. Um, and, uh, and also that is final, uh, being able to predict the orbital periods, that the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit, which is sort of the, take the, uh, the distance from periapsis to apoapsis, and divide, add that together and divide by two, and that's what you call the semi-major axis, and that you can actually now calculate the period if you know the semi-major axis. And um, these laws hold till today. They're still used, and they work perfectly. They're bang on to the data. What was interesting, though, is that even with that, um, it wasn't immediately accepted. Like, people really didn't like the idea of the heavenly bodies. Even people like Galileo didn't like this idea of the heavenly bodies not moving around in circles and with constant motion, this perfect motion around, but were these messy ellipses and sometimes they're further from the sun and sometimes they're closer and sometimes they're going faster and sometimes they're going slower and this kind of application of this mundane earthly physics really sat wrong with people. But of course Kepler was 100% right. And it was him that really kind of led us on to the right trail of finally attaching physics to these heavenly bodies uh, and not just uh, some sort of divine orbital motions. And as we begin the process of setting up our encounter with Moho, our second encounter with Moho, I want you to take a look at Moho itself and hopefully you'll notice that there is a probe that is right there pretty much on top of the planet and that is the first vessel that I sent many episodes ago on its way to Moho that is now only a couple of days away from its closest approach to Moho. So uh, that will be something that you will for sure see in the next episode and I suspect barring some crazy disaster that might happen somewhere else. Who knows what might end up happening, but uh, that will probably be the highlight of our next episode because that will be our first interplanetary encounter. So that, that ah, for me, I always find those things uh, exciting in these careers, these, these moments of meeting other planets. But in the meantime, we'll set up this encounter, and I launched this vessel quite a bit early, which is never a bad thing to launch it early. It's easy to sit in low orbit, but the actual launch window is not going to be for another 18 days. So clearly, that is going to have to be for a future episode, and in fact, I think this will end this particular episode. So uh, I hope to see you next time for that uh, close look at MoHo. And uh, yeah, we'll see you then.